Okay, let, let's move to the second speaker of the day, which is uh, Professor Fulvio Ortu from the Bocconi University, He's currently oh. visiting at the Imperial oh. College. Oh. Is necessary. Madonna. And he's okay. going to talk about the implication of return predictability in stock and real estate markets. No, no, I'm not going to do any <laughs> real estate markets. Uh, no, sorry, so. implication of return predictability across horizon for us. Right, right, sorry. right. Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, it's a great venue, of course, a beautiful room, and uh, uh, a great uh, uh, set of speakers, so I'm really honored to be here. So this paper is co-authored with uh, uh, Carlo Favaro, and, uh, uh, who is a, a colleague of mine at Bocconi, and uh, who is a PhD student of mine, and Andrea Tamoni, who is now at LSE, used to be my PhD student, and uh, then he moved on uh, to LSE when he went on the market. So uh, let me see if I get this. Yeah. All right. So I, uh, you, I, I like to say that I have a Nobel motivation for the, uh, this talk, Nobel in the sense of the Nobel Prize, uh, and it's quite interesting uh, considering the uh, talk that we have just heard, compared with the talk we have just heard, that in this case uh, the academic uh, side of the uh, business seems to be very much in, in, uh, in, uh, in accordance with the uh, uh, more uh, business uh, oriented side of the business. As you see from the motivation, the motivation, uh, the, this, this is actually the press release of the Royal uh, Swedish Academy of Science for uh, when they awarded in the 2013 uh, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics uh, uh, to Jim Fama, Lars Hans, and Robert Schiller. There's a way to predict the price of stocks and bonds over the next few days or weeks, but it is quite possible to foresee the broad course of this prize over a longer period, such as the next three to five years. So there seems to be quite a bit of accordance in there, and so I'm going to be uh, looking at that, in fact, as a motivation for the paper uh, that I'm going to present in here. So the uh, research question that uh, we want to uh, discuss here is the following one. If there is valuable information for predicting stock and bond prices, and the more so, the longer the horizon, so the uh, longer the horizon, the more information you can extract. Uh, uh, to use uh, to predict uh, bond and stock prices. Uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, uh, as a, uh, an asset pricer comes uh, to your mind is how can you use this information to discriminate uh, among competing asset pricing models? So uh, you have a, um, a large plethora nowadays of uh, competing asset pricing models. What is an asset pricing model? It's a model that tries to price get the right price of uh, uh, financial asset in general, in particular stocks, if you wish, or bonds. Uh, uh, an asset pricing model, per se, usually, is not a model that wants to predict the price in the future. It wants to get the price right uh, uh, over time. And on society, two things are the same. So one of the questions, and in fact, that question, the most important question we want to push here, is to try to understand what is the relationship between predictability presence of predictability, existence of predictability, and how you can use that predictability to discriminate across different models. And uh, uh, when we look at the question from that point of view, we want, first of all, to understand if there are methodological cautions that we need to take in order to use this predictability to uh, discriminate across models. And in order to do this, we want to use some tool to understand how to discriminate across models. And the uh, tool that comes to our mind, the, the, the one that's been developed, in fact, by one of the three uh, people that got the Nobel Prize there, which is Lars Sansen, who happens also to be my advisor uh, a long time ago, uh, are the uh, uh, variance bound, or Hansen and Jagannathan uh, bounds, as they are called. And so the idea here is to understand how we can incorporate conditional information coming from a set of predictors in the uh, uh, diagnosis of the variance bound to discriminate across different models. Basically, if you wish, at the end of the day, we're going to be running a horse race among uh, uh, a certain set of different asset pricing models to see how they fare if there is predictability and if this predictability is included in the uh, diagnostic tool of the uh, variance bound. This is the basic idea. 
Very good. Uh, so methodologically, uh, we're going to discuss a very simple condition uh, that are going to allow us to, uh, under which we're going to be able to, in fact, use a variance bound to discriminate models when the variance bound, again, incorporates information for a set of predictors. And we're going to need to uh, 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 look carefully at this methodological issue because, in general, in principle, predictors, the predictors that you want to use to predict over time uh, uh, the course of uh, financial assets are not necessarily the state variable of a model. There is, in general, a distinction between state variable, informational content, the state variable of a given model, and uh, <coughs> predictors, information in the predictors, and you want to understand when the two can work together, and there is a mathematical condition on conditional expectation, in fact, as we're going to see, that very simple but makes clean when you can, in fact, use the information from a predictor that, in principle, can be external to a model to weight in on ascertaining uh, the performance of different models. And from an empirical point of view, we're going to be examining three leading asset pricing models. When, <clears throat> if you look at the asset pricing literature in the last uh, decade, I would say 20 years, uh, that, you know, there are basically three uh, uh, leading uh, asset pricing models emerging. External habit, Campbell and Cochrane, those are the guys who, uh, you know, with quite a bit of uh, heavyweight Beko engineering, but they were able to pretty much pin down the, uh, 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 at least unconditional equity premium in a pretty good uh, fashion, and this is one of the most quoted paper, and uh, it was the coronation, if you wish, of a long literature habit model, internal habit, we go back to Abel, and so on and so forth, and it's still very much used. Long run risk, beginning of, uh, uh, beginning of the uh, 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 last decade, beginning of 2000, in which there was this idea of uh, a slowly moving, uh, uh, dynamically moving component uh, in consumption that made uh, risk accumulate over the long run, and so the fact that the equity premium is really a premium too long to, to risk that will evolve in the long run, when uh, investors have, of course, uh, 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 preferences in which uh, the, uh, uh, the um, intertemporary assistive substitution is uh, divorced from the, uh, from the uh, uh, coefficient of risk aversion, and so you can disentangle it to things like in, Epson, in the Epson case, which are the preferences that they use. And then the uh, rare disaster model that goes back to RITS. In fact, RITS was the first one to uh, uh, observe that if you have a sudden and huge drop in consumption, that could generate huge uh, equity in premium, and then resuscitated by Barrow and, uh, and discussed quite, uh, quite consistently more, uh, recent, in the recent years in the literature. In fact, we're going to be considering, uh, in particular, uh, uh, um, in this class of model, the external habit model of Campbell and Cochrane, in fact, as estimated, as I'm going to see by Gallant, uh, Aldrich and Gallant, uh, the long risk model estimated by Salki and Yaron, and the uh, uh, rare disaster model on Nakamura Station Baron Sua, which is a uh, more developed and more interesting model that I'm going to discuss later on. For this model, we are going to be constructing predictors based bound, that is, variance bound, answering Jarnat and conditional type bounds using information coming from a set of predictors that I will uh, discuss in a second. And then we're going to show that this condition here is satisfied for these three models. So those bounds, those are bounds that, in fact, you can use to discriminate the, uh, uh, the, to discriminate the three models. And uh, we're going to use, in fact, this predictor-based bound to explore the role of uh, uh, predictability in the econometric evaluation of the three models across models over time and using the information for the predictor. So we're going to be... Uh, 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 look at all these three dimensions, uh, uh, conditional information coming from the predictors, horizon, changing of horizon, and uh, uh, different models uh, uh, in the sense they said before. Very good. So uh, the main funding, we're going to see that if we use a simple, very simple linear predictive model, uh, we're going to have the, 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 uh, the, the simplest possible predictive model. Basically, for stocks, I'm going to have stocks and bonds. I'm going to have... Um, uh, I'm going to concentrate on the U.S. here. So I'm going to have the U.S. market, the wide U.S. stock market, <clears throat> and I'm going to be using a uh, price dividend and CAY, let I do this on CAY, to predict uh, uh, stock market. And I'm going to have bond, I'm going to have treasuries, in fact. <clears throat> I'm going to be using the level and the slope to predict treasuries. There are no tricks, there are no crazy predictors, nothing. Um, we are not even using Cochrane-Piazzese's CP factor, which is very fashionable nowadays, and 
we are abstaining from that uh, as well, just to make sure that we are using the most standard predictors that are available around. Uh, I'm going to investigate uh, empirically the condition I was uh, discussing before. I'm going to show that this condition holds. And we're going to see that eventually when you run the um, horse race between the three models, the model that uh, comes ahead by quite a bit is the rare disaster model. And the one that in particular in the long run seems to uh, fall back quite a bit is the long run risk model. So the long run risk model seems to be the one that is most challenged when the horizon increases from the answer angel and atom bounds. So this is, uh, uh, and let me uh, spare you the road map and let me get going uh, right away. So let me get you a very basic primer of the uh, basic answer and jargon atom bounds. So, you know, most of the asset pricing literature now is synthesized in terms of a stochastic discount factor. What is a stochastic discount factor? If you have a set of returns, a stochastic discount factor is a random variable, mt plus h, the final sum um, probability space, of course that uh, satisfies this condition here. That is, that price is returned. These are returns, so the price of the return must be equal to one, and so you satisfy this condition here. You can show that a stochastic discount factor exists as long as uh, there is uh, no arbitrage. In fact, as long as the low one price is satisfied, a strictly poised stochastic discount factor, if and only if there is no arbitrage. Standard stuff. So the basic idea of uh, 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 Lars and Ravi Jaganata was the following one. Well, you know, let me do the following thing. I have, in general, if markets are incomplete, and uh, typically we believe that they are, and typically they are, you cannot span everything, you have a, a plethora of different stochastic discount factor. If you have a plethora of different stochastic discount factor, you can compute this over lower envelope of the variance of all these stochastic discount factor. So basically, you compute for any one. <clears throat> the classical factor achieve this condition, you compute the uh, minimum variance conditional on some level of mean, where that level of mean is, of course, the shadow uh, risk-free rate, right? Th that would be the right price uh, uh, of a, a risk-free uh, zero coupon bond, right? Uh, and in fact, more importantly, Anson and Jaganathan in the JP91 paper, they show that this duality holds. In fact, this... Uh, a lower envelope of the volatilities, the variances of the stochastic discount factor, in fact, is exactly equal to the maximum uh, sharp ratio square. This is the sharp ratio of uh, uh, the set of returns over all possible portfolios, in fact, uh, uh, um, scaled up by the square of uh, the new value, right? So this is a standard basic uh, uh, Anson and uh, Jagnathan bound. All right, let's assume now that we have predictability. What do I mean for predictability? Let me be <coughs> very precise in definition. Here, I'm simply assuming the following thing for now, from a methodological point of view. I'm assuming that there is a set of, uh, rand, uh, um, uh, a set of random variables such that when you compute the conditional expectation, condition on the sigma algebra generated by those, uh, 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 by those random variables, well, the conditional expectation has some positive variance. The basic intuition is that when you observe different realization of these random variables, you associate to that different possible realization of the returns. This is the basic definition of uh, 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 return uh, predictability. Well, at this point, if you have uh, uh, a set of uh, 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 returns predictors, what you can do is to try to price the same returns you had before, conditional information coming in the predictor. So you can do conditional pricing instead of unconditional prices. And for conditional pricing, it means this thing here. Instead of just looking at the fact that the uh, unconditional uh, uh, expectation of the uh, return discounted by the stochastic discount factor is equal to one, I want that to be a I want that to make it into a conditional expectation. That is, I want this to be equal to one conditional information in the predictor. Uh, and uh, you can collect all the stochastic discount factor that achieve this uh, into, a, a, of course, a set, and you can take the minimum variance in the set of the stochastic discount factor uh, over uh, the, the set of variances of the stochastic discount factor, the price of total conditioning on uh, the uh, predictors. Okay? And of course, since 
the set of uh, stochastic discount factor that achieve this conditional price is smaller than the uh, larger set of demand condition that achieve unconditionally, of course, this bound is going to be a higher bound. This is the basic idea in which if you have conditional, if you have information coming from predictor, you can discriminate better because in, in general you can impose a higher threshold on the volatility of the given stochastic discount factor that you want to see if it does price or not a model, right? In general, every model is identified by a stochastic discount factor, so this is going to be uh, giving you a higher uh, yardstick for models. Okay? Very good. So, um, to, to have a, a little bit of a better intuition uh, for what this, uh, uh, that we call predictor based bounds, uh, uh, do achieve, look at things in this way here. Consider now to form portfolio, WTs are going to be portfolios, and assume that those portfolios are allowed to depend on the predictors. Instead of just taking unconditional portfolios, just vector in RN, now you take random variable, that is you allow your portfolio to depend on the realization of a predictor. I'm going to be investing upon observing the realization of a predictor and deciding my investment strategy conditional on the realization of a predictor. So WT are going to be random variable in uh, measure with, with respect to the margin generated by Z, uh, we want them to be portfolios, and then we're going to be evaluating all the returns that we can obtain by this portfolio. Usually they're called managed portfolio, managed condition along the information coming from the predictors. And, uh, well, it's uh, an obvious mathematical thing, but it gives you the intuition for why these, uh, 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 these uh, condition bounds are uh, useful. Well, it's an obvious mathematical thing that this condition is going to be satisfied. So those stochastic discount factor or the stochastic discount factor, the price, all the portfolio managed to account, uh, to take into account information coming from the predictors. Okay, and in fact, there is a nice uh, result available in the literature. Baker and you have been the one, first one to observe, uh, and a bunch of other people look at this fact. You can extend the duality of uh, Ansel and Jaganata to this conditional bound, and you can show that in fact, this uh, uh, predictor-based bound, conditional bounds, bounds uh, on the volatility of the stochastic discount factor, the price returns conditionally, is in duality with uh, the maximum uh, scale uh, square sharp ratio over what portfolios? Portfolios that can depend from information in the uh, conditioning variable, in the predictors, and they need to have an average price equal to one. This is a random variable now, right? Uh, and uh, it's enough that they are equal to one. So there is a duality result, which is very useful in the computation that we're going to do of the bound. We're going to be, in fact, using this duality result because it's much simpler to compute maximum sharp ratio than, in fact, uh, looking at the, uh, uh, at the other, uh, at the other uh, part of the problem. So very good. Now, how does this work with asset pricing model? So we have our, uh, remember now, we have our set of returns. I have predictors that is random variable, such that when I look at the condition, uh, uh, return, conditional information and predictor, there is some action there. The condition expectation moves around with the realization of the predictors. I even talked about asset pricing model now. Okay, let me put the asset pricing models into the picture here. What is an asset pricing model? In its bare bone, an asset pricing model is a set of state variables. And when I'm saying a set of state variables, I'm saying a set of variables, a set of dynamic equations, because the state variable moves uh, 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 across time. Typically, the models gonna be described, I'm going to be discussing here uh, are in discrete time. So the state variables are going to be a set of difference equations. Typically, you're going to uh, use stationary uh, uh, stochastic process. So these are going to be, say, AR1, ARP, ARMA, whatever. It depends from model to model, right? The way in which you model the random variables. So when I'm going to be talking about state variables, here I'm going to be thinking not just in, sense, in, in terms of a vector, but in, in terms of a set of dynamic equations that describe the evolution. And then, uh, Together with the same variable, you have a stochastic discount factor. What is a stochastic discount factor? That's what really prices asset. And that comes from the margin rate of substitution of a representative agent at the optimum. That comes from utility. So you have two components. The dynamics of the state variable, the state variable with their dynamics, and the preferences of the investors. How much you prefer to consume today versus consuming tomorrow. This is basically Lucas 78 uh, in its bare bones. Yeah, the basic intuition of asset price. Very good. 
So, and as a pricing model, satisfy this condition. To make an example, I'm going to be looking at three uh, classes of models, right? As I said, long run risk. What are these components, long run risk? Well, long run risk use uh, estimates in preferences. So, if you take uh, the log of the stochastic discount factor in long run risk, it has this nice, simple log uh, linear uh, uh, um, uh, representation in which this is the uh, consumption growth, stochastic consumption growth how much the aggregate consumption in the economy grows over time. This is the return on an asset that pays consumption as a dividend. And who are the state variable? Well, in fact, the basic idea in uh, 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 Bansal and Yarrow, the basic long run risk model, is that consumption growth has stochastic first and second moments. So the conditional mean of stochastic growth moves around, and it is a long uh, stochastic equation, and the conditional volatility or variance moves around. That is the idea of, uh, that is the, in, in its bare bomb, Bansal and Yarrow. Okay? Another model we're going to be looking at is Campbell and Cochrane. What is uh, different here? Well, Campbell and Cochrane, instead of looking at absence in preferences, they look at these external habit preferences. <clears throat> so their stochastic discount factor in log linear term. It's going to take this expression, GT is going to still, uh, GT plus H is still going to be consumption growth. ST plus H is what they call surplus in the consumption ratio. Remember, these guys have this external habit, so they measure the consumption with respect to the habit, which is this exogenous habit, this exogenous level of consumption from which they measure differences from, right? It's the keep, keeping up with the Johnson's type of uh, 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 utility function, and the main driver of their model is this uh, growth in uh, surplus consumption, together with the uh, consumption growth. And so those are the two state variables that have their own dynamics. You can read them up in the model. Uh, and in fact, the interesting thing here, that the dynamics for a state are nonlinear. One of the tricks of, uh, of Campbell and Conga is to introduce nonlinear dynamics, which really get a lot of action uh, going. And finally, uh, Nakamura and Al, the Red Disaster Model Nakamura and Al, they have exactly the same preference. This is very interesting. And we like to, to use this model uh, together with the other ones, because in some cases, you use completely different preferences and dynamics for the same variables. In other cases, you use the same preferences by different state variables. And so you can really ascertain what is really kicking in, right? Preferences, uh, state variables, which one is doing what? In the Nakamura et al. models, they have the same uh, preferences as in the normal risk model, uh, Epstein, Zin, but the state variables are different. What they have here, they have disaster, that is, they have basically jumps in the consumption. But the cool idea, the really cool idea in the Nakamura et al. model, compared to the standard Bauer model to all the other rare disaster models, in our opinion, and this is why the model is going to be performing so well, is that you can have slow recoveries from disasters. The very original borrow model, you have a disaster that basically it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a random walk, it drops down and it stays there. The expectation is it stays there. Here instead, when it drops down, you have this, you have, there is a probability you're going to be recovering. And the recovery is going to be slowly over time. And when you're going to have a recovery, since you had a disaster and you can hit the recovery, that's when you're going to have predictability of surprises. So this is what is going to be doing a lot of the, uh, OK, so these are the models you're going to be looking at. All right, so the question is the following one now, formally. Remember, I have my lower envelope of the volatility of the stochastic discount factor, the price returns, conditional information in ZT. ZT are predictors. Nobody says anything about the fact that ZT belong to the state variables of a given model. They live in a different world. They are random variable. There is a big uh, uh, probability space, uh, some L2, just to be you know, comfortable with. Behind, all these uh, variables live there, but you have the ZT on one side and the XT on the other side, right? And the models care about the state variables. Who does predictability in this world cares about ZT, OK? So the question is, when can we make ZT and XT, if you wish, talk? to each other. When can you use both of them? In particular, when can you use information in ZT to ascertain something that lives in the world of uh, DXT, if you want uh, to, you know, to give a business school type of uh, uh, explanation. 
uh, coming a bit uh, more to the math side here instead, uh, well, uh, what I want to do is the following thing, very simple. Let me augment, let me uh, consider the uh, sigma algebra generated by x and z. So I augment, if you wish, the information. I put everything in there, all the information as a variable, all information in the predictors. And the proposition is very simple. Well, uh, given a certain level for the stochastic scan factor of a given model identified by say variable x, suppose that this condition here is satisfied. Then whenever uh, the stochastic scan factor mx price is returned conditional on the information of its, uh, of its uh, state variable, because this is what the, the, the um, uh, asset pricing model needs to do. The asset pricing model conditions on its state variable. It doesn't look at the information that there is in ZT. But if this condition is satisfied, basic tower property, simple tower property, iterative law of uh, conditional expectation, tells you that, okay, if this is satisfied, then the predictor-based bound, the lower envelope obtained from uh, stochastic discount factor, the condition on the information in ZT must be a legitimate lower bound for the volatility of the physical factor of that model. So this is how I can use information in the predictors to ascertain a given asset pricing model. If I can find a set of predictors for, uh, uh, such that the information, the, um, such that this condition is satisfied for the N asset pricing model, all those N asset pricing models can be ascertained through this predictor based bound. This is the basic idea. Very simple methodological idea. Uh, but uh, we find it uh, quite useful. Um, uh, there's been a lot of literature looking at the relationship between predictability and pricing. Uh, one of the first guys that look at this thing was Kirby. There is an RFS paper uh, back in 98. But you see, the basic idea there is that Kirby will say, okay, the predictors are a subset of the state variables. I want to see that if a subset of the state variable predicts on prices, then things are easy, right? Because uh, that condition they have there is obviously satisfied, right? When you uh, have the Z as a subset of X, the filtration generality is always the same, right? Okay, it, it's still useful because in his approach, you want to see is, is information, is it correctly priced by some rational asset pricing model? We don't want to answer the question, is there some asset, rational asset pricing model that prices returns that depend from information in ZT. No, no, we want to answer the question, given those asset pricing models, can I use information in those given predictors to ascertain those asset pricing models? Which is a different question, and that's why I need that uh, condition there. And the basic uh, uh, thing is that I cannot assume FZT to be in, uh, 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 including in FTX, uh, and uh, since I cannot ex ante assume that, I need to impose the condition, okay? Uh, okay, this is, uh, you can uh, rewrite it, uh, you know, in terms of saying, well, you know, if the condition is unsatisfied, then you can predict, uh, use the uh, ZT to predict discounted returns. Discounted returns in equilibrium needs to be martingales, right, by definition. Basically, when you use a stochastic discount factor, it's like you're using a risk neutral probability, and the risk neutral probability, they are martingales, right? Well, if the condition is not satisfied, then the uh, discounted return wouldn't be martingales. Condition on the information in X, comma Z, of course, right? And also you can rewrite in terms of uh, R square. In fact, you can see that under that condition, if there is a free rate, uh, well, there is disorder in the R square, must be less than the risk free rate, uh, the, the uh, minimum, the, the predictor based bound uh, 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 um, scaled up by the square of the risk free rate, which in terms must be less than the uh, uh, volatility of the uh, uh, stochastic scan factor of the given model squared up by the risk rate. Very good. So uh, let me uh, take you to the data now. So I have a methodology. I want to implement the, uh, the methodology on the data. And as I told you before, I'm going to be running very simple predictive equation. I'm going to have stocks. I'm going to have bonds. I'm looking 52Q1 to 2012Q4, that uh, uh, time interval. Um, um, my predictor, as I said before, price dividend and CAY let I lose in some. Uh, and then for uh, stocks, so I'm looking at US data, just to be, uh, make it very clear. And uh, for treasuries, uh, I'm using the spread uh, that is the slope uh, and the level of the yield curve to predict uh, future holding period. Everything here is in real terms. 
uh, as an asset price, I don't care about nominal. Either I have, you know, either I have uh, a Taylor uh, rule, and so I can do, you know, nominal pricing. But without a Taylor rule, uh, nominal returns are useless. C oh, okay, CAY are uh, permanent deviation of consumption from the trend, uh, the equilibrium trend in asset pricing model. It's defined in this paper uh, by Letau and Ludvinson, uh, Journal of Finance. Here you have, look, here you have, these are... Data set, it's yeah, a macroeconomic are, it, data set. These are standard uh, uh, representative consumer asset pricing models. So you have yeah, only no, one no, guy. Uh, exactly. Consumption is aggregate consumption. Okay. And wealth is aggregate wealth. Okay. Uh, in wealth, there is also human capital. So there is a component of human capital. And so these are the deviation from the long run trend. Uh, basically, are the deviation of long run trend of consumption versus long run trend of wealth. Thank you very much. Which is a variable that you know, it's now in, in, you know, in asset pricing literature, the let like, let out lose some variable is with the price dividend ratio, the one to be proven to be the, the most uh, reliable in, uh, in, uh, in uh, forecast. It's, it's, now it's one really is a standard SPD. Uh, 2001 Journal of Finance, or JP, I can't remember. I'll, I'm going to look it up. Well, it's in the paper. No. Uh, very good. I'm going to look at two sets of returns. Set A, just the market, and then I'm going to be rolling over three months T bill over holding periods. I'm going to be looking at holding periods of H equal one quarters, H equal four quarters, H equal 20 quarters. So I'm going to do one quarter, one year, five years. I really want to see how this thing works over the horizon. And I'm going to be looking at two uh, sets of return because uh, in set A, as you can see, you have the equity market and the three-month T-bill rolled over. So that is really the basic set on which you want to uh, ascertain the equity premium puzzle. This is really the set for the equity premium puzzle, right? So the first question is going to be, are these models, when you incorporate uh, information from the predictor, able to deal with the equity premium or not? If you have information for the predictors. Second question, I'm going to throw in there also a bunch of uh, T-bonds. And in fact, I'm going to be looking at the returns from holding 5, 7, 10, 20, 30 years constant maturity T-bonds holding over which period? Over, holding over uh, uh, a one quarter period versus a one year period versus a five years period. And that's why I want to have, you see, this long maturity uh, T bonds because they want to hold them over up to five years and I want them to be cost and maturity so they need to have a maturity longer than five years. So I cannot do Pharma Bliss here because if I did Pharma Bliss, I couldn't, I couldn't do the five years. And we like this better. Okay. Uh, all right, this is just to warm up the uh, basic predictive regression. As you can see, you know, predictability grows over time. You see CAY that kicks in big time over 20 here, right? These are the R squares. Uh, you know, these are the standard regression that you see everywhere. We're just, you know, uh, uh, showing, putting them up because, you know, if you run this regression, you have to show the result. But there's nothing new in here. This is what is new. And this is what? These are the picture of the uh, uh, unconditional versus predictor-based bound. Remember, right? I first I compute in the unconditional bound. I computed the lower envelope of the variances of the random variable that satisfies the equation EM times R equal one, the unconditional. And then I computed the lower envelope of the volatility of the stochastic discount factor that satisfies the equation EM times R conditional on FTZ equal one, right? It's a lower set, so the lower envelope is gonna be higher. How much higher? And this is what we have estimated using actual data. And what you can see here is that, which is what you kind of expected, but this is documented, uh, so the one below, of course, is the unconditional uh, hansen jagannathan bound. The one above is a conditional one. And as you can see, well, of course, the conditional, the predictor base are above, but the predictability really kicks in over time. The longer the horizon, the more, uh, the, the, the higher the bound, right? So if my, the basic idea is that if my condition, and this is for set A, and of course, if you do it for set B, boom, big time. Why? Obviously, that is the effect of adding asset, right? The more asset you have, the less stochastic discount factor you're going to have to price those assets because you are increasing the span of the market. The stochastic discount factor in the orthogonal, the bigger 
the span, the smaller the orthogonal, the higher the curve. Uh, so this is the effect of increasing assets and increasing predictability of those assets, right? So as you can see here, you're going to have very high uh, ER6 uh, uh, to use to measure different uh, uh, asset pricing models, right? Very good. So uh, the effect of predictability on the variance bound increases with the horizons. So let me uh, skip that. I need to test condition star. Here I'm going to take a big shortcut from a mathematical point of view, of course, because I'm going to be assuming that condition expectations are linear. Yeah, I know, but that's what I can do for now. Let me test it linearly, and then we'll see uh, how to uh, take care of nonlinearity. In other words, remember, condition star is uh, you can use your uh, predictor base bound if the condition expectation condition on FTX is equal to a condition expectation condition on FTX, comma z, right? So uh, if the world is linear, a big if, but if the world is linear, what I need to test is this one here, right? I run the discounted returns on uh, the state variable, and then I run the discounted return on the state variable and the predictors. And I want to see if, uh, basically, what I do, I compute the difference of the fitted values. To be more precise, uh, I have data on the returns, I have data on the predictors, the models I need to simulate. So what I do, I simulate 1,000 samples from the model, 1,000 sample for the state variables, 1,000 sample for the stochastic discount factor. I do 1,000 regression. I compute the fitted values. And my criterion here is to say, OK, you know what? If 90% of distribution of this difference includes 0, I do not reject for now my condition star. And I go ahead and use my predictor based bound as legitimate bona fide bounds for, my, uh, for the stochastic discount factor of the given model. Ah, very good. So this is uh, a condition star for the Rangis model. For equity, we do also for bond. This is for uh, uh, external habit. And this is for rare disaster. So the condition, at least in this linear fashion, holds. So we go ahead. We go ahead and, uh, um, ah, by the way, I don't know how to, how do I go? No. Just to show you that this condition has a little bit of discriminating power. There are cases in which it fails. Look at this case here. What is this case? This is the obvious case in which we should fail, right? Suppose that you have a CRA, you have the Mera Crescott model with AED consumption, growth. In that case, of course, the, uh, uh, the returns need to be uh, constant and unpredictable, right? And they are not. And so the condition, of course, fails. So it's a little bit of an example. Cheap, if you wish, but a cheap example that shows you that the condition. Uh, OK, all right. So here you go. Bounds, conditional, unconditional, and models. This is long-run risk. What you see here, the little star and the triangle are respectively simulated values with estimated parameters and simulated values with calibrated parameters. So what is it that we do? We take the long-run risk model, and we run it for 600,000 times. So we are looking at the uh, limiting distribution. And we look at the mean and variances of the stochastic discount factor in its limiting distribution, OK? We do it. Remember, we have parameter because the, the low motion of the state variables and the uh, preferences are governed by parameters. So we use both parameter estimated from data and parameter calibrated by the auto. The differences are not big. What are the ellipses? Uh, around these things here. Those are uh, basically confidence interval computing using the, dental the de delta method of, uh, uh, um, uh, of uh, Burnside and, and uh, uh, um, Cecchetti, Nelson, and Mark. Basically, they, 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 you know, they try to do inference on the, uh, um, they try to compute <coughs> confidence intervals on these ergodic distributions. Uh, and what you see here for long run risk is that uh, when you look at uh, the unconditional bounds, the long run risk is right spot on, right? It makes the bound, so it's right there. But when you start challenging it by throwing conditional uh, information coming from the uh, uh, predictors, right, the model starts getting uh, uh, really challenged, in particular here and uh, at the one quarter and the, and the one year horizon. At the five year horizon, there is a lot of uncertainty in those estimates, so it's very difficult to really make a call. 
when you look at uh, uh, the external habit, and this is set A, so the equity premium set. The external habit is challenged at the one quarter horizon, but then it starts doing extremely well over the one year and one quarter horizon. That is, again, by doing well, it satisfies the bounds on the minimum volatility of its stochastic discount factor to be able to price the given service. Those are all necessary conditions, eh? obviously. So we are discussing necessary conditions for a model to be able to price. Uh, very good. And uh, look at uh, uh, the rare disaster model. Why only one year and five years and not one quarter? Because the model is estimated on a yearly frequency. You cannot have a quarterly uh, probability of disaster. If you have every quarter a disaster, you live really in a scary world. So basically, you don't pick up any probability of... Uh, uh, all right. Um, and let me show you uh, when I throw in also T-bond. So I'm expanding now the set of assets. I have the uh, equity market, I have uh, treasury bonds, okay? So I'm gonna have a tougher bond. You see here, the long run risk really, really, really struggles. It even struggles to make the unconditional bound, let alone the conditional bound. So this is where the long run risk is really challenged by, uh, by uh, uh, these uh, bounds here. Also the five year horizon. How about the, uh, 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 the external habit model? Well, the external habit model is definitely challenging the one quarter. It's clearly challenged also the one year horizon. So it's not, on, it's not going to be able to price over a one year horizon a universe, a un investment universe made by uh, the, the stock market and uh, holding uh, treasury bonds over the holding period. Uh, it does much better, it picks up a lot of volatility over the longer horizon, okay? How about Nakamura et al, the rare disaster of Nakamura, big time in. This is by far the best performance model. Uh, let me spare you that. How about uh, uncertainty? You say, well, you know, I mean, you have a lot of uncertainty. You're doing these bounds and you, you're estimating, so there must be some uncertainty around these bounds, right? To take care of that uncertainty, we do bootstrap. We use bootstrap to bootstrap confidence intervals around the bounds. So the uh, green things here are gonna be the bootstrap bounds, right? So here we are really trying to be as careful as possible. We have uncertainty around the bound, uncertainty around the estimate of the stochastic discount factor. Even if for factor in uncertainty, you see that our risk model still uh, uh, struggles uh, quite a bit. Uh, while uh, the, uh, so basically, what I'm showing here, to make a long story short, uh, is not uncertainty. Even if you look at the bootstrap around the bound, still the result that showed before uh, 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 hold. Very good. Um, how much I have? Minus, minus two or plus two? Plus two. Plus two, okay, very good. The very last thing. So, the, 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 which we think, this is a comparison between Nakamura and the rare disaster of, uh, uh, of Bauer, or the plain of Valina, if you wish, rare disaster, and shows why Nakamura is doing better. But this is a thing that we consider uh, quite interesting, that we really think quite interesting. So the question is the following one at this point. All right, so uh, we uh, have evidence that uh, um, information in stock and bond predictor is useful to discriminate uh, 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 among different asset pricing models. If you have information for predictors, as long as the condition is satisfied, you can say which model is gonna have a better chance to price or not. Because we have a necessary condition and we can run the different model versus a common necessary condition and see if they all satisfied, none satisfied, some does, some doesn't, okay? So this is why the diagnosis is useful, right? The question is the following. Satisfying this necessary condition, is it one-to-one -one in being able, the model that is, being able to reproduce the predictability that we document in real life? In other words, suppose that the model satisfies the necessary condition. Does it mean that that model is going to produce model-generated returns that exhibit the same level of predictability as in real life? and vice versa. If you don't satisfy the bound, then you don't not gonna have enough predictability. So is our test equivalent to seeing if the model is able to replicate predictability? This is the question that we're posing, okay? And the answer is a sound no. And how do we answer uh, no? Okay, so what we do, now we're gonna uh, drop CAY and look only at the PD ratio. So the simplest possible predictability condition. 
We do the following thing. We generate, we use every model to generate returns. We have a pricing equation, so we generate returns from the model. So we simulate returns. So we're going to have actual returns from the data set, data stream, and simulated returns, OK? And we run the predictive regression both on actual data and on simulated data. When we do on simulated data, we're going to have simulated returns and simulated predictive ratios, right? So we want to see how much, from that point of view, models look like reality. And how does that triangle with satisfying or not the condition, OK? This is what we are doing. And this is the cool uh, result, in a sense. What do I have here in this picture? In this picture, I, have, I do 1,000 simulations. So I construct 95% intervals. So I'm going to be constructing for every simulation the R square, and I give you the distribution of the R square in these 1,000 simulations, OK? Uh, and then I look at the real data R square. And I want to see if the real data square lies inside that confidence interval from the 1,000 simulation, right? Because from this standpoint, if the real square lies for every model inside the confidence intervals, every model has the potential to generate uh, the predictability, which is uh, 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 documented in real life, right? And this is what you have. As you can see, Every model, so the blue dot is the model implied median value of the R square in that distribution. The F distribution, which are crazy, right? In particular, the rare disaster is usually, you know, with a long, long, long tail, right? So the median is very close to uh, the lower bound. But still, you have 95% intervals. So, uh, and the triangle is the data R square. And so you can see that all models have the potential to generate uh, the same predictability. However, some models do better than the other in the sense that some models are really able to replicate the median of the distribution in the simulation, while other models are completely far off. And what can we assume? These are the data. Well, we can assume that, remember, not all the models have the same ability to satisfy the necessary condition, but they all have some ability to replicate the predictability of the data. So as a consequence, replicating predictability is not the right criterion because it can give you models that apparently do a good job, but they don't satisfy a necessary condition. So we consider our bounds to be uh, uh, better than looking uh, at uh, replicating predictability. And I think I have to quit here. I, no, I'm, I'm pretty much done. So I mean, I, I can show you, you know, the usual size of what we've done, but you, you have pretty good memory, so you remember what I've done, right? So you don't need me to. OK. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, we are quite short in time, so are, are there any one, two quick questions? Yep. In this external habit model, you have this uh, surplus consumption rate. Right. How do you measure that in the data? Because it depends on some underlying coefficients. Do you just... Uh, we, we use uh, we use uh, um, uh, um, uh, what's his name Aldrich and Galant. There is a paper in Journal of Financial Econometrics 2011 that estimates the uh, habit model. Remember, we do both with calibrated parameters. So the calibration is uh, uh, Campbell and Cochrane, and then we also use the estimation of the parameter from Aldrich and Galant. So we get it from there. There is a financial economy, Journal of Financial Econometrics 2011. I have a quick question, which is sure. related to the uh, uncertainty that you have when you want to estimate the regress, the coefficient of the regression in this kind of processes. Because since both the returns and the predictors depend strongly on the prices, you have a strong dependence between the idiosyncratic errors and... Yeah, yeah. What, what is your uh, impression? Uh, I mean, this is a curse of all the predictive regression, right? Yes, this is a standard absolutely. curse of all the predictive regression. We don't address that issue. We understand of that issue. We are taking, you know, the, 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 the exercise here to say, okay, there are these predictive regression. You can discuss, I mean, there, there were entire issues, the RFS had a 2008 issue entirely on predictability, right? So you had the Goyale and Welch uh, paper, there's no predictability, the dog... Uh, John Cochran's dog that did not bark paper, but so on and so forth. We don't take a stand on predictability. We are saying, look, 
uh, if there is predictability, this is how you have to do in the right way the exercise of using the predictability uh, from a variance bound diagnostics. So that is a methodological thing that we have. Second, if you use that and if you believe in those regression, I, you know, I mean, I, I basically believe, but we can go on discussing, uh, I don't want to discuss that. If you believe in those regression, you use the estimated model from those regression to estimate conditional uh, moments of the distribution return, and you put them into the standard machinery of uh, the conditional answer Jaganathan bound, this is what you get for the model. This is what we document. I mean, it's important, I understand, but then, you know, that is an issue with predictive regression in general. And with, with, this is not a paper about predictive regression. This is a paper on how, if you take the predictive regression, how can you use them to discriminate across as a pricing model over different horizons? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's thank, thank you. Thank you.